I am Dana Castle, the Director of Strategy here at Function, and we are an agency that specializes in the building and construction industry. And there's been a lot of conversation floating around about social media and how to use it in our industry, and it's been kind of a big conversation. So we have brought some experts together to have a lively conversation. So I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. And first we have Stephen Thompson. And Stephen is the social media manager from Archetizer, where he leverages a community of over 1 million followers and fans to drive the website's 6 million monthly page views. He has consulted on social media to several relevant design organizations and publications. And in 2012, he graduated from University of College London with a master's degree in urban studies. So welcome, Stephen. Hello. Thanks. And next we have Enoch Sears, and Enoch Sears AIA is a licensed architect and author of the book Social Media for Architects, and he has presented in the U.S. and abroad on how architects can leverage social media and web tools to attract the right clients. Also, um, he is curates business of architecture, and he has graduated from Cornell University with a degree in architecture and is a practicing architect in California. Enoch. Yeah, great. Next, thanks for thanks for having me. No, thanks for being a part of this. And then next we have Mark Mitchell, and he is a consultant and author in building material channel marketing. He solves sales and marketing problems for building product companies with strategy. Mark's new book, Building Material Channel Marketing, is also available on Amazon. And Mark uses social media to reach building product suppliers with sales and marketing advice. So thank you guys for being a part of this. And um, I will be moderating today, so let's kind of get started. All right, so our first question is, who is using social media in the building and construction industry? And so, Mark, I'm going to start with you if you want to jump in and give us some advice. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. If I'll give you some observations. I, <laughs> I think that social media right now is the Wild West, and I think that there are a few rules to follow, but basically I think that people are just trying things. Some are working, some are not, or most are not, in my opinion. Um, but when I look at who's using social media, there's two things that surprise me. Um, one is that architects, contractors, builders, and dealers are way ahead of building product manufacturers. Um, some of these people are doing a very good job. Uh, others, are, I give them points because they're at least trying. Um, I think they see it as a marketing equalizer in that no one can outspend them in social media. Maybe they can outcontribute them. Um, they don't understand why manufacturers, with all the money and marketing smarts they have, are not participating in social media for the most part in a meaningful way. Um, an example of this is I don't know what happened with plumbers, but on Twitter it seems like every plumber in the United States is on Twitter. I don't know whether there was an article, there was a conference. That it, it, it shocks me that every plumber is on there. Now, many of them aren't doing a lot with it, or what they are isn't very smart, but they're on there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I also, um, uh, when I look at the people who are on, the architects, contractors, builders, dealers, and plumbers, and other trades, um, the best people are people I can tell there's a personality. I tell there's a real person there. I can tell they enjoy it. They're participating regularly, and they're commenting on different things. You can tell you're talking to a person. Um, the other surprising thing that I, my observation at least, is that the U.K. or England is ahead of the U.S. Uh, when I look at building material, architects, green building, all those different things, I see much more activity in my mind from the U.K. than I see in the U.S. from a, we'll just say from a scale standpoint. Um, Looking at who uses uh, social media besides the, what I'll call the, the, the channel members, uh, the manufacturer, I think, does the best job is GAF. Um, I think that they're always fresh and relevant. I think they're very successful using Facebook to connect with roofing contractors that I, I would have told you a year ago made absolutely no sense to me. I didn't see how a roofing company could connect with roofing contractors but they're doing a very good job of it, and I would encourage people just to, to follow um, GAF on Facebook for ideas. They do very little, hey, look at my cool new product, and a lot about look what this contractor did. 
uh, or here's how to make your business better. Um, I also think TAPCO does a good job, but could be a little stronger. Um, Home Depot and Lowe's are doing a good job, but they haven't quite figured out how to localize it. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado, where we had big floods last week, and I there was a very active Twitter feed. It was it was amazing. I finally really appreciated some of the power of Twitter, and I was shocked to not see Lowe's or Home Depot participating um, in how to what to do after your house has been flooded and so forth. Um, I'm also surprised at how Kohler, who I think is a brilliant marketer, uh, treats social media as an extension of their ad campaign and seems to measure the success by the number of likes they get rather than the connections they make. It probably follows their strategy of focusing on the consumer and, and not so much thinking that the trade is that important. Um, so those are my thoughts on who's participated in social media. Okay, that was very good. Um, Stephen or Enoch, did you guys have anything else you wanted to contribute to that? or? Yeah, I have just, uh, I'll put my input. This is Enoch speaking. Okay. So I've also seen, I'm a little bit more active on Twitter than I'm on Facebook, and I've seen uh, Firestone Building Products. I just want to throw their name into the mix because I've also noticed that they have a, a very good, they've done really well with video and YouTube. So I encourage other building product manufacturers out there to go check out and see what they're doing. And uh, they also interact well on Twitter. So we just want to back up what Mark said about the interaction and the providing of, of valuable content, but also the personality that it's really about, you know, a lot of people when they're on social media, they're there because of the relationships, they're there because they enjoy making friends. And if there's a face behind the brand name, even if it's a social media manager, it's going to provide a lot more of a connection. Right. No, I would have good. to reiterate that. People are really looking for a voice. And so not just someone who's going to put this like product specs uh, out in the air and nobody will necessarily respond to that as much as if they really open it up to conversation. Right. Also, yeah. Companies that are engaging in that way that have kind of like hit the sweet spot on that are the ones that are seeing the most success, I think. Right. And making it valuable to what they're saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the next question we have: What social media platforms are most effective in this industry? Um, so, Stephen, do you want to jump in and start this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it really depends on exactly what your company is hawking. Um, uh, we mentioned before Twitter, and I think that's a really great uh, basic platform for everyday customers to stay efficiently informed on, like industry news and products and just get the facts out there without all the visual noise of other platforms. And also since we're talking not about like lifestyle but more so industry uh, and like up import stuff, um, LinkedIn is really valuable. Pretty much all professionals are on there. Not everyone knows exactly what to do with it. A lot of people just see it as why am I putting my resume up there? But you can really use that as a way to um, proliferate content or um, news about products. And um, and if uh, say if a product has a special aesthetic tilt, a more image-heavy tool like Pinterest or Tumblr would be really essential. And those two platforms are great for quote shareable content, and so it can shift around between users uh, amazingly quickly. And then if a product has um, a really novel process of use, or if it can even be confusing to visualize, then we now have these great formats like Vine and video on Instagram that can make it all the more accessible to people on social media. Right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Mark, did you want to add some uh, thoughts on that? Just, uh, I was going to start off basically the same thing. I think it depends on who you want to reach. Um, you first have to start and think about that. For the trade, I, I like um, LinkedIn, uh, particularly go beyond LinkedIn and go to the groups. And I would say find groups of people you want to engage with. I would once again tell you to do it as a person versus a company. I find most company LinkedIn pages are simply, here's the description of the company, and if you want to apply for here's the jobs we have open. They do a poor job to me of, of uh, promoting their products. Um, I also find more and more of the channel is on Twitter, using Twitter, um, and it's, it's, it's a dialogue. Um, I would use things like uh, Google Alerts. If I was a roofing company, 
I would want to be the leading source online and through social media of all things roofing, not just my products. So I would have Google Alerts looking for in news about roofing, and I would be every day looking at that and putting things up that would be of interest to my followers about roofing that aren't necessarily just about my roofing product. Uh, they could be about an unusual roof, a new roof concept, maybe that I don't even make the product for. Um, it, it gives you credibility to me. You can also make Facebook work, but to me it takes a very different strategy. Um, YouTube is also good. Um, I think most companies are also missing the opportunity to use Google Plus, which uh, at first, and I probably still don't understand why Google Plus exists, but it has a Google author program where if you as a person have a Google Plus account with your picture and you write posts and put them on there, it starts to recognize you as an expert in the subject and you start to pop up, um, uh, you get better search engine results, additional search engine results. Um, so those are my thoughts on what to use. Okay. And Enoch, did you have some other things you wanted to add? Sure. You know, I just wanted to use, you know, obviously excellent comments from both Stephen and Mark. And, you know, I think you're going to be hearing a lot of us talking about the personal aspect. You know, I don't want to beat that dead horse too much. But that's sort of probably going to be something that comes up with all these questions is that it's really about, it's about dialogue. It's about back and forth. And so in terms of what social media platforms are most effective in this industry, I said there's, there's two things that first came to mind when I saw the question. The first one is that it's, it can be a little, little overwhelming to look at all the different platforms, you know, because we have LinkedIn, we have Twitter, Facebook, we have Snapchat, Vine, Instagram, Google+, and they just continue to multiply. You know, there's Tumblr and Reddit, other platforms like that. So there's... You know, I would look at it one of two ways. Okay, are we going to try to do a blanket approach and try to hit everything and get our message out there across all platforms? Are we going to focus on one or two of them? That would be like the second option. Are we going to hit one or two of them really hard? And, I mean, that's something that the company is going to have to make a decision on. I, I've seen success in people concentrating on one or two particular social media channels but then reproducing or repurposing a lot of that content for their other social media channels. So I really think that with each channel, you're going to get a different set of users and a different kind of person. So for instance, just to give an example, with Twitter, I found that there's a lot of thought leaders and influencers on Twitter. They're very uh, progressive people that like to share things. And if they're on Twitter, they're probably on everything else too. So those are the kind of people that you they can help spread your message. Uh, as Mark mentioned, LinkedIn is obviously a great place for, for, for professionals, and I've also found the groups to be the, the best place to uh, interact. One other service I did want to mention is house.com. For those of you who are in the residential building uh, product category, you know there's probably a lot of uh, possibility to team up with or do some advertising uh, on house.com and uh, highlight products on there. So it's a little bit different. It's not quite a social media space, but at the same time, it is a resource that a lot of people are using right now. And that's H-O-U-Z-Z.com. Um, another option for, for architects and people in the industry to, um, to network is actually on Architizer. And there is a new um, system for specking products and for people to share uh, what they've used in past projects. And so I think that could be a really good asset that could supplement all the other platforms that are very interactive, but there's kind of been a hole in that way. Right, good. Okay. Absolutely, I'll, I'll second that. So it's just not Stephen pitching Architizer, but <laughs> it is a great <laughs> platform. So, And once again, the people, the architects that frequent Architizer are also usually a little bit more progressive in terms of uh, getting out there and being voices and influencers. That's true. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question is why should um, the building product manufacturers use social media to launch products? And then the second part of this question is how can you use social media to generate buzz leading into a product launch? So we've already talked about some of this, but um, you know, tying it into a, a product launch is, is slightly different. So, Mark, do you want to start us off with this? Well, well, first of all, I, I, I'm going to say I don't think 
social media is a good tool for new product launches if you haven't established yourself on social media to begin with. To just all of a sudden show up and say, hey, look at this wonderful thing, in my opinion, will not be very effective. Um, I see it as developing a trusted friendship before you can hit them with an all-out sales message. It's like a friend recommending something to you versus a used car salesman. I'm sure that you know someone will creatively figure out how to do what I'm the opposite of what I'm saying. But in my experience, the best way is to have built uh, build a trusted relationship in an audience. And if you've done it right and you respect your audience and you don't abuse their attention, you only share with them valuable helpful things uh, as unbiased as possible, then when you do have a sales pitch, they're more likely to say, oh, look, you know, look what Harry's sharing with me today. I'll take a look at that. So that's my right. thought on it. Yeah, and you've, so you've already built the relationship to be able to do that. Yes. So. Okay, and then Enoch, did you have some thoughts? Let's see. Let me see the question here. Why should building product manufacturers use social media to launch projects? products okay mm -hmm. so in answer to that I would just say I wouldn't say necessarily that they should use it um, but you're gonna reach more people with a social media strategy so I guess that would be the reason why uh, they should consider it is the ability to reach uh, an expanded audience and a lot of leverage and obviously with online tools what we're talking about now is a lot of leverage for instance with a uh, the same amount of effort you can reach 10 people or you can reach uh, 500,000 people. It just depends on the strategy that you mapped out right. and, as Mark mentioned, the engagement with people. And Right, too. I think you have to think about the cost, too, like you're saying. It, you reach more people as well. So. Exactly. I mean, you could take out a full spread in an architect magazine, and you might want to do that in addition to some social media um, blitzes, but there is that that ability to share. I mean, that's why we're talking about social media now, I think, is because everyone knows that these things have a great reach. Uh, in number, the second part of the question was, how can you use social media to generate buzz leading into a product launch? So there's a couple things. Uh, the, the one thing I'm going to throw out there is that if you do have engagement with your audience and engaging content, then, and people start sharing it, it's going to build momentum and it's going to give you some some web juice and it's going to um, keep people's eyes on your on your product. So if you plan out the strategy really well, and I think that's what we're going to talk about next, and map out a strategy to attack all the different social media networks in a very systematic way, and not make it overly promotional, as Mark said, but think about it creatively about how um, what your target viewers would be interested in, then. I mean, the sky's the limit. I don't, we haven't really tapped it yet. I don't think anyone's tapped the full potential um, of this kind of stuff. Because if it does go viral, and that's a rare thing, but some people have manufactured that kind of thing, uh, that is just, you've hit the gold, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so, Stephen, I'm going to start with you on this one. How has social media affected the role of marketing and public relations professionals? Um, well, I mean, some people originally threaded that social media was destroying PR, but what it's really done is just sort of took it apart and remade uh, the publicity and marketing machines for something that's much more dynamic uh, rather than a top-down, press-release-driven system. And um, it's made it easier for companies to integrate news about their products to their customers into their everyday routines rather than just targeting them through, say, a magazine ad or a newspaper article, and as well as encouraging dialogue, as we said, with engagement. Uh, so people can ask questions and then, like, kind of, like, tip their colleagues off on the right products to go with. So at the end of the day, um, outreach uh, can be much more relevant and efficient than it was, say, 10 years ago. Right. Right, that's true. Um, Mark, did you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, I think that it hasn't affected them as very much um, so far, as much as it should. I find that marketing and PR people in building product manufacturers are, for the most part, in my opinion, stuck in their current roles. They see social media as an add-on that they will move into when they are giving more people in budget. I think the money and people are already there. They just need to stop doing some of the legacy, legacy things that they think they have to keep doing. Um, for example, cuts in trade shows, trade ads, printed materials are three areas that I see companies 
continue to spend money that I think they could take some of that money and move it towards social media. I think they also don't understand how to approach social media because they're used to a very rigid approval process in which they, they write something and 18 people have to look at it and comment on it, which then starts to slow it down, water it down, and make it very stiff and tilted. Um, I look at it as you trust a salesman at a trade show to have a conversation with a client. Um, why wouldn't you trust your social media person, whether they come from your PR department or agency or marketing department or agency, to have the same kind of dialogue? They're just having it online. Um, and I don't think they've been able to move to there. They see it as like I'm writing a press release, so 18 people have to approve it, which makes it take too long, cost too much, and, and not be effective. So that's my thought. Right. No, I think that's a very good point about the approval process because – you know, people can get stuck in that, and then then the, the information's not timely or relevant anymore. So, okay, so um, Enoch, I know you want to talk about this one. <laughs> what steps might a building product manufacturer begin with when planning a digital strategy for a product launch, or really just even planning a digital strategy? Just get out there, just do it. You know, and there's. Going back to the previous the previous um, uh, conversation about uh, the formality sometimes of the of the more legacy advertising methods out there, you know, there's there's a place and and a, obviously an important reason why those things were developed the way they were and why they happen like that. With social media, it's such a new world that I think people need to or companies need to figure out how how far they can go in terms of being a little bit less formal so sort of to um, how is this going to affect our brand in the big picture but in terms of planning the strategy I think that uh, the more systematic the approach the better so I would highly recommend an, uh, an editorial calendar of content that's going to be shared and syndicated to the, the different networks there's also opportunity to engage uh, field reps salespeople or other people that might not be in the marketing department of the company and you know I've seen brands be very successful with sort of spreading some of that some of that juice out there some of that power you know some of that um, what am I trying to say so you know with the market usually you have the marketing department pushing out the marketing for the company if you can like Mark said and take some of those conversations online and and find a way for your sales reps or people who are out there in the field to converse over social media. It can have an exponential effect upon the uh, the brand awareness. So just to just to summarize, planning a digital strategy for the product launch would be to you know talk about which social media channels you're going to use, focus on what kind of content you're going to create for those specific channels, and then map out a strategy that involves uh, numerous posts to each channel that leads up and provides some information, maybe you're telling a story, maybe you're opening up some intrigue. Uh, I remember you know, it was like 10 years ago when they talked about that Segway, the thing that the little motorcycle scooter, and there was like a year buildup of this thing's going to revolutionize the world. So I just bring that up as a point of there's different things you can use like uh, intrigue to sort of build that buzz and that momentum. And quite honestly, I think social media is a good fit for that because it's so fluid. You know, you don't have to take it to the printers. You don't have to take it to the press and get it printed in a magazine uh, you can just put it out on a daily basis and that's why it's um, it can it can create buzz and it can roll and uh, gain gain steam and it builds upon itself that's good information okay so another we always get a lot of people asking about blogs and how important they are so Mark, can you kind of um, give us your thoughts on blogs and you know, have you seen some successes with blogs? Sure. Is this question still to me? Oh, it's, it's Enoch? well, you can answer it, and then I, okay. I think Mark can jump in there too. But go ahead, Ina can answer it. Great, great. Okay. So blogs, there's 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 two main reasons why I think that blogs are so have gotten um, people really harp on the value of blogs, and the first reason is because it. Google is looking for content. It's going back to search engine rankings. 
uh, having a content rich website and something that's updated frequently does wonders for search engines because Google wants to provide the most relevant content to their to their users and also being in the other search engines out there and so really the game of of trying to gain the system with SEO is it's getting harder and harder to do things that SEO tactics that people were using five years ago and the the one strategy that's really coming out on top is is content so when we talk about content we're referring to useful useful blog posts white papers information that maybe you you originally had in a in product binders this is all wonderful content so I think most product manufacturers out there have a wealth of content that if they could repurpose that and put it into a blog format um, and just release that trickle that out slowly over time it would just have massive impact for their personal website and that will do wonders because if an architect's doing a search for instance on EPDM roofing or TPO roofing and and your website has that content and Google likes it you will appear as the first search result so I think blogs are definitely much more of a long-term strategy but they're really easy to do if you repurpose the content and what I mean by repurpose is you could take some information you've produced in the past and have throw a new spin on it or spruce it up a little and release it over time once again with the end goal being not to put out fluff but to put out real content that you think architects or your target market whether they be contractors etc are going to be looking for so that's the first thing I would say about blogging the second thing I wanted to put in there is that there's a lot of bloggers out there who are influencers and thought leaders and even if you don't have a blog if you reach out to and find out who those people are and connect with them some of them have massive followings uh, I think Stephen just mentioned you know Archetizer they have a blog and you know at the beginning of the call so somewhere of you know six six million monthly page views so these are the kind of people that that if I was a building product manufacturer I would be looking at them and connecting with them and figuring out you know what things do I offer that th their audience would find useful right yeah, and I was thinking about what you were talking about as a whole of content. So that goes back to the question we had before, that about planning a digital strategy. So really, part of that planning phase has to be look at your content as a whole, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And, and one thing that I, that I did about when I was talking about this planning the strategy is I would also go out, I would make a list of all the influencers on the different social media networks. I'd say, okay, who are the influencers on Twitter in my, in my niche? You know who are the influencers in the blogging space and I would look at their work try to figure out is there a hook is there a way I can get them involved and have them share one or two of my links um, because I've had people approach me before and and with the right approach I am willing to share stuff that is not um, or that I would find valuable for my audience mm -hmm. so can you tell us this, this just kind of uh, generally how would you suggest people to find the influencers they're looking for. I mean, I know everybody has a different way to do it, but for you, how would you look for influencers? So on Twitter, what I would do is, first of all, you have to find one of them, and I think they're they're fairly easy to um, to find because if you're involved in the architectural space, for instance, in in on Twitter, you'll see the same names pop up over and over. But after you find one person, then you figure out who they're talking to, and a lot of something I found very useful are Twitter lists and uh, Twitter list if you go to someone's profile you can click on their list and they make lists of for instance architects so a Twitter list you might go there and you might find a list of a thousand architects and so that's that's one uh, one thing I would do with Twitter uh, on Facebook obviously the uh, the influencer isn't so relevant because it's more it's more spread out and it's not like there's people tweeting which you have is uh, a bunch of users viewing content um, moving over to something like what am I like leaving out? Like a LinkedIn out? or something or, or yeah, LinkedIn, so LinkedIn might be yeah. LinkedIn obviously you can see who has a lot of connections but I would look for people I would once again I would join groups and look for people that are commenting a lot and um, seem to have sway with with other people you know people who are really engaged out there 
Uh, one person that comes to mind is Sue Butcher. She is, uh, I think she's a practice manager out of the UK and uh, she does a great job. She's a big social media influencer. So uh, does, does that help Dana a little bit? I would yeah. just to summarize, no, I and would I find just... one or two and then follow the strings and see where else they lead. Right. No, and I just thought it would be something just to bring up because, you know, some people are, some people know how to find influencers and some people might be just beginning. So I just wanted to kind of discuss that. So, you know, at least everybody would kind of know where to start if they hadn't done that before. Absolutely. Great point. You know, go so to, in terms of you. bloggers, go to Google and do a search for architect blog and you'll, you'll come up with a list of, of blogs right. that are influential. Yeah. Right. Um, Mark, did you have um, any thoughts on blogs that you wanted to share with yes. us? Yes, I think they are critical. Um, I think it is this huge open opportunity for um, building product manufacturers, mainly because none of your competitors are probably doing it. So if you're the first one in there, to me, you will own the category. So I, I see it as a white space in terms of search. Um, I think that there needs to be somebody dedicated to it um, and contribute on a regular basis. I would start by saying, who's my audience? And when they're going online, what are they typing in for search terms? Um, if they know that they are interested in Firestone TPO, they're going to type that in. Um, they'll go right to the website. They'll get the information. Um, if they type in TPO, um, uh, every TPO manufacturer will pop up. What pops up probably won't pop up as much, and Google would love to see, is how to make a TPO roof last longer, uh, installation tips for TPO, um, what to do about damage on a TPO. You know, I'm just rattling here, but uh, is TPO the right roof for you? Um, I see these as, as big open spaces that Google really loves and moves you up to the first, uh, first page. Um, I think that there needs to be a person dedicated to it. I find sometimes that uh, I love the idea of the salespeople contributing, but I find many times you'll have somebody like a technical or engineering person who wants to, very important, they write a blog post. And the whole process comes to a stop while everybody's waiting for that person to write a blog post, which becomes, you know, this, this work of art. Um, I don't see any one blog post as having that much value. I see you need to do it so you can get a lot of good content out there. Um, you know, for example, in my blog, I spend 90 minutes to write a 350 to 500 word blog post. I have one person review it, proof it, and up it goes. Uh, I see people taking way too long, um, then going through, as we've discussed, the layers of approval, which takes out all the point of view and takes out the personality. Um, so I just, I would start, I would get a blog going, I would put a person whose job is to make sure it's contributed to at least weekly, and I would write things that are aimed at the search term that you think that your audience is going to be putting into Google. Also, it's a good idea to comment on other people's blogs, and um, because uh, I think that's a great opportunity to continue conversations that's not just on Twitter or LinkedIn comments, but uh, and that can really help to get to know a blogger personally in a way that might be limited in, say, 140 characters otherwise. And um, eventually that could drive traffic towards you. But on the converse, if you're leaving a comment on a blog, a pet peeve among a lot of bloggers I know are people just commenting, spamming their own blog. And so uh, there's a real opportunity for dialogue there if you finesse it well. All right. No, that's a good point. Okay. All right, Enoch. Um, we're going to go back to you, and the question is, how can a brand gain followers without paying for them? <laughs> <laughs> well, you did mention that it is possible to pay for them, and that is that is true. Uh, anyone who starts up a social media profile, I just want to throw it out there that there are sources where you can buy followers, but those followers are basically what we call empty, fake, dead followers, uh, robot accounts. So if we're talking about real engagement, how can you gain followers? There's only one true strategy that I know of, and that's to engage with people. That's to interact and interact some more and interact some more and share share the content of the people you want to engage with. Uh, the strongest bonds I've formed with people on social media are people who share my content. Uh, and it has to be sincere, of course. It's not just someone tweeting or retweeting everything I tweet or, or liking all my Facebook posts. 
but adding value to the conversation. So very simply, I would say to, to gain more followers, engage with individuals because it's it's about it really is about the individual. It's about the individual person and the aggregate of in, engaging with individuals over over time. That's where the big impact happens with a, a brand's social media um, efforts. Right. Yeah, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And just to add to that, I would say that uh, to, I'll give an example of interacting might be, uh, you know, there are things where you can do Google alerts. You can go into Google and set up a Google alert where any um, – if a blogger writes about your product, you'll be notified. Then you can go comment on it and add to the conversation. There's also ways you can monitor Twitter and some of the other social media platforms for conversations that relate to your area of expertise. And, and that's where you start to form those relationships and, and just go into it with the idea of giving. So that's, those, are, those are, I guess, would be my two pointers is set up automated searches that alert you and then go out there and just get to know people on, an, on a first name basis. Okay. Mark um, or Stephen, did you guys have any other thoughts about gaining followers? Um, I think that, um, that one thing is to be patient. Um, you're not going to go viral overnight just in terms of followers. I mean, it helps to have the most engaging content possible, but um, if you launch a Twitter account for your company and you don't have a million followers within a month, don't get too frustrated. I think you just have to be uh, genuine in your engagement and you'll get that organic growth eventually. Right, that's true. Okay, Okay. Um, so Mark, let's start with you. Um, our question we're asking, should a CEO be on social media? And if so, which platforms and why? Well, well I would love to see a so CEO on social media and I thought for a long time they, they should. I now believe that um, you can't force it. Um, there are a few um, CEOs who recognize the power of it and, and are willing to devote the time, and they just have the personality that it fits and the confidence. Um, most CEOs do not. Um, many CEOs that I do go, well, that's stuff my kid does. Um, and it hasn't quite resonated with them. You also have a lot of CEOs that are into, they aren't comfortable with things they can't control, um, particularly CEOs that used to be a CFO. Um, they want to control everything, and you have to trust and be willing to let go of some of that control to be a participant in, um, uh, in, this, in social media. Um, so I literally think we're going to have to wait for, I'm going to call it the next generation of CEOs to come on board, um, and I would tell whoever in the company can take the lead and start making it happen and slowly educate the CEO and see if the CEO gets enthused about it uh, in terms of personally getting involved. So I don't hold out great hope in the next, I'm going to say, two years for us to see a lot of building material CEOs on social media. Okay. So if if they... If CEOs were on there, what platforms would you suggest? Like LinkedIn or LinkedIn and and in the groups of LinkedIn and Twitter would be two great places for them to start. Um, you know, if they tend to be, many of them are good charismatic personalities, and they could have a lot of. I could see a lot of videos on YouTube. Um, you know, it would show. It would connect them with their customers. It would show the customer, wow. You know, the CEO of this company really cares about architects or contractors by the tone of what he talks about. Um, it could be very powerful, but I just don't see it happening for a while. Right. Okay. Stephen, did you have some thoughts? Uh, yeah, I agree. It totally depends on the CEO and the amount of charisma. If it's an industry personality who has sway and like a real reputation as a test make, uh, as a tastemaker or a thought leader, then absolutely it can help humanize the company and make it all the more relatable, giving it a face. And uh, but if it's just kind of a a more vanilla guy who's a great manager but makes decisions behind closed doors, then having a more savvy social media manager, like PR, marketing person, like taking the helm might be better because otherwise, if you have different people getting out the message, it can dilute 
or even confuse uh, fans. And so, yeah, you have to be careful. But in general, I think it can be a real asset. Okay. And Enoch, did you have anything? Sure, yeah. When considering whether a CEO should be on social media, I would just say that they need to take an overall look of what they would want to accomplish. And I'm just going to throw a name out there. Someone who's done this in the past and is doing it very successfully is a man by the name of Michael Hyatt. Now, Michael Hyatt formerly was the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers in Tennessee, I believe, and they're one of the largest publishers of uh, Christian books for the Christian market. And when he was an early adopter, this is just a little case study, he was an early adopter himself of social media, but it was really tough for him to convince his uh, board of directors that using social media would be good for the brand and good for the platform. Uh, eventually he went out, he went ahead and did that, he convinced them to get involved in social media, and within six months to a year it just exploded their brand. And you can find out more about that by doing a web search for Michael Hyatt. I would um, encourage other people out there, CEOs, who are wondering um, what benefits would social media have for my organization or what benefits would it have for me as an individual to look at Michael Hyatt. Uh, I would say there's two benefits. Number one, it can add a personal uh, personality to your company and once again uh, connect with your users in a, in a more personal manner. And secondly, as a CEO, you can also cr start to create a personal brand, which is kind of interesting. And that's a whole nother conversation. But right. once again, I think that people in, in the upper tiers of management, CEOs, they know about making connections. They know about taking people out to lunch. They know about you know, playing golf and, and the tried and true business development methods. Social media is just another, another space for those same relationships to happen. And so... Definitely, there's value there. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to see, like I said, if you want to see someone that's done it and get ideas about how, how an, a CEO might do it, I would say take a look at what Michael Hyatt's done. Okay. No, that's good. I'll, I'll have to look him up. <laughs> okay. So the next question, and I'll put this out to all three of you, um, and we've, we've covered a lot of this already, so if there's other things that we're missing, aside from informative post about products, you know, what else should a building product manufacturer share and what and on what platforms? And we've talked about a lot. So Mark, we'll start kind of start with you. Ha have we left anything out or do you have any other thoughts on this? Uh, no, I think we're, I mean, uh, um, assuming the audience agrees with me, <laughs> but yeah. I think we're progressing along nicely and, and covering a lot of good information that someone could take and move forward with and hopefully not getting too deep or too technical. Um, right. But if we were looking at that, um, are we ready to talk about question nine? Or yeah. So what? Like, is there? Is there, we've already talked about a lot of, um, you know, things we can do in different platforms. But um, you know, so what else? You know, aside from informative posts about products, what else should a building manufacturer share? Well, a thing that I, I would maybe start with the idea of a number or a ratio. And a ratio I would like to see that would be that only one post out of ten is talking, if you will, selling one of your products uh, or saying, look at this wonderful example. Um, I would, and for different companies it might be different, but I would have an aggressive goal of nine out of ten. If I were a paint company, for example, I would want to have things about color. I would want to have things about finish. I would want to have things about how to clean. I would want to have things about unusual uses of paint, even if I didn't make the paint. Um, I would just want to be, wow, this, nobody knows more about paint or is trying to be as informed and helpful as this paint company. Um, and then one time out of ten, I would slide in, oh, by the way, we have this new paint uh, that's reflective or is a, is a, is a moisture barrier or whatever it is. Um, so it's, that would be the type of thing I would do. Okay. So, um, Stephen, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree. I think that um, that 10% rule would be a great thing to abide by. And, yeah, share relevant news that could interest potential customers to show that uh, you're not kind of in your own, stuck in your office building, that you're really engaged in, uh, in the changes that are going on because it's such a, an ever-changing industry. And... Um, and also, people love to laugh, so keep in mind that you should never keep the content too dry, and people 
kind of view still social media as um, like taking a break a lot of the times from their day-to-day -day activities at work. And so they want to be at least a little bit entertained. Um, I mean, don't make everything a complete joke, but um, <laughs> do put in a little bit of comic relief here and there that's relevant. Right, I think that's a good point. Um, Enix, so you, you can add to that, and also, you know, the big question is how many updates per week do you think are appropriate? Okay, so in terms of, aside from a form of post about products, I think what I, what I've I've seen uh, the ratio that Mark was talking about to be spot on about 10% is is a good ratio to go for in terms of uh, promotional material versus informative material. There's a, a great podcast out there that a friend of mine runs that I recommend people uh, listen to. It's called Inside Social Media, and it's ran by a man named Rick Mulready. He interviews the head of some of the largest and most successful companies in the world, and part not that not the heads of the companies, but he interviews the heads of social media for these companies. And there's some very interesting case studies in there. For instance, I heard a very interesting one recently. Uh, where he was talking to Brad Walters, who's the director of social media for Lowe's Home Improvement Store. And it's great because in the interview, Brad gives a lot of examples of things that, uh, that Lowe's is doing to engage with their audience on different platforms. And just to give you one example of something that's not promotional um, and really not informational is, and sort of went viral, was this little video they did with Vine. Now, Vine is sort of the Twitter for video. Uh, I think you have a little six second video and then you upload that to Vine and people can share that. And in this particular video what it shows is a, we've all had this experience of stripping out a screw. I don't know if anyone out there is like me, you know, you tweak that screwdriver a little too hard and it begins to spin. So in this video you see they show how to use a rubber band to place it in the screw head and then back out the screw. So just a simple little thing people see it they're like wow they get the idea in in uh, six seconds and it was it it went viral you know um, now obviously I, I going viral is is not something that like I said before can be manufactured easily but for a resource of other resources to share you know just look at what other successful business out there are doing there's a lot of fortune 100 500 companies that are out there who are sharing very, very interesting things. And uh, with this podcast I mentioned, uh, they really get into a lot of the details of how they're doing it. So there might be a lot of fodder there for ideas about how the companies uh, building product manufacturers could engage and provide content. And just really quickly, in terms of number of updates, I would say the more is the better because a lot of uh, to a certain degree, as long as it's good content and as long as it it's not overly promotional, then you really need to post be posting things throughout the day. So, you know, Twitter you might have 20, 25, 30 posts a day if you can produce that kind of content. Uh, Facebook, uh, you might have a little bit less um, because it does stay in the timeline a little bit longer. So it, it's going to sort of also vary by by the platform. But I would say the Twitter. You know, you look at, I think 20 would probably be reasonable throughout the day. And people obviously have the ability to filter out content they don't want. So you don't want to get in that category. You don't want to be putting out too much. And that's where the ratio comes into it that Mark was talking about. Uh, people will quickly filter out posts that are promotional in nature or not along with their interests. So even if you're a company, even if you're tweeting about the latest cat video, that could be a good post <laughs> because it okay. engages your audience. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and can we go back the the podcast? That's what did you? It's called Inside Social Media. Yeah, it's Inside Social Media, and you can find it at rickmulready.com. It's R I C K M U L R E A D Y. It's just a fun podcast. You know, I think each episode is about thirty minutes long, and he talks. You know, he's had the head of social media, the NBA, on there, Nickelodeon. Um, very interesting information. Okay, great. I'll have to look that one up too. Yeah. Okay, so Stephen, this one's for you. What time of day is the best to post updates? Um, what time are you know? What time is everybody online checking social media? Do you think? Um, I'm 
when they're in front of their computer, so nine to five, but it's important to keep international reach in mind. If you want to target a product towards Europe or Asia, then you're going to have to put in the extra crunching of numbers to see when it's going to be nine to five over there. And um, studies show that around 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. is really kind of like the crux of the day for catching people on social media because that's the period after employees come to work uh, when they're signing on to take sort of like their first social media break after catching up on stuff once they get to their desk. And um, in general, the morning's more crucial than any time after two because that's when people sort of either start to get really immersed in uh, getting their work done for the end of the day or just start leaving the office. And, um, and so I will try to utilize the afternoons more so for um, maybe more tangentially um, related information, not for making like a big pitch as much as um, for kind of just like um, sharing it, an article or something that might interest people. Um, and the same goes for the weekends. It can be more of a branding exercise to share interesting and entertaining content. Um, but yeah, so in general, uh, try to hook people in the morning. Okay, that's good advice. Okay, so Enoch, how important is YouTube and how can a building product manufacturer use it? Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> just being an architect, I would say YouTube is number one. If there's one thing you're going to do, use YouTube. <laughs> And the reason why is because, listen, as I'm doing drawings and I'm trying to figure out a particular detail or I want to know how a roof goes on or I want to know exactly how do the tradesmen trowel on that stucco, you know, I'm going to do a Google search for that. And if there's a video that explains and shows how that works, uh, that's what YouTube is really, or any video format is great for showing how something's done. So if you, I think Firestone's done a great example of this where you go on their website and they have a lot of wonderful videos showing their tradesmen putting down and installing the roofing materials. And so, I mean, that's an instant win, you know. If you, and it doesn't have to be a high, high budget production. I know video can get expensive if you get a full on video crew out there. You know, I've seen great videos done with iPhones and, and those can be shared immediately on YouTube. So the second thing I'd say about YouTube, you'll notice that when you do a Google search, if it's a result from YouTube, it has a, a larger picture next to it, and so it's a lot more appealing for people to click on. And just from personal experience, if I'm uh, running a search on a particular product and there's a YouTube video, that's the first thing I click on. And if the video provides the information I need, then I'm going to keep on going back there. So I, I think that YouTube is great, and as Mark said, you know, the people that get on there first can really dominate it. I think the the challenge for companies will be deciding, you know, how much how much resources, how many resources do they want to devote because like I said, it can get expensive. So just finding that balance between, okay, do we want to have the perfect audio and the perfect studio lighting or do we just want to try to get the content out there and that's going to be on a you know, company so as a, how to do but that. as an architect, I mean, you you're just there to look at, I mean, you know, the information you need on that YouTube video. So you would be okay with it not being a perfect production, correct? Oh, I absolutely, mean, absolutely. From my standpoint, I mean, if it's if it's a um, an iPhone video, I really don't care as long as I can tell what's happening and as long as it's useful. It doesn't look like it was. It doesn't have to look like it was produced in Hollywood. Okay, no, that that's good. That's good to know. Yeah, you know, tours of manufacturing facilities. Um, every smartphone nowadays, you after you take a video, you can instantly upload it to YouTube. So I'm sure there will be some editorial review of the content, but the field's wide open. So I look forward to seeing what other companies are going to be doing in that space. Okay. Did um, Mark? Did you have anything to add to YouTube? I know you had mentioned it earlier about YouTube. Well, I I just think yeah, YouTube and and the the, the Vine videos that Lowe's did that was just a superb effort. You know, the, a new technology comes out, they grab it, they did really creative efforts and it and it went viral. And it, to me it shows how it gives them a, a coolness factor that differentiates them from Home Depot. Right. Yeah, I thought I think everybody's probably on their phones looking up that video right now. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one. Okay, so um Mark, let's start with you on this one. What makes you um, influ makes you an influential industry voice, retweet or share an update from a building product manufacturer, and what kind of posts influence you? 
Well, so so my audience is other building product manufacturers. That's what I, I consult with is helping building product manufacturers solve sales and marketing problems. So I'm looking for uh, I'm looking for posts, tweets, whatever they are that I say, wow, that is a brilliant marketing idea, like what Lowe's did. Um, that I then want to share that in context of this is some, some smart marketing you should pay attention to. On the other side, I look at things that I don't think are so smart and say, why did they do this? Why did they miss this opportunity? So that's my, my focus is on when I see things that, that I think that my audience will benefit from that. I want to share that with them. Okay. And Enoch, did you have some other things to mention? Yeah, I would just want to just totally back up what Mark said that uh, for me, and I think it's probably the same for others, that you know, the reason why I am a voice online is because I've taken the time to provide valuable content and so I curate my content. I don't, I don't throw just anything out there. And so just have to figure out, you know, whether it's me or someone else, what are they looking for? What's going to be appealing to them and to their audience? And, and take it from there, you know. And I'm very happy to share things that are, for instance, interesting, entertaining, controversial, and they don't have to deal with your product. But, you know, even if you share something that doesn't deal with your product, if it, if it has your brand name next to it, you're going to promote your brand recognition. So I would just say um, f there's a framework you can follow. You know, your, your, your posts can fall into one of different, a couple of different categories. They can be controversial. They can be informative. They can be entertaining. And, and if it fits in one of those, you know, I'm going to share it. It's, it's the same as any marketing message is um, providing real value, Dana. And it's part of your personality, too, as, as to what you would choose probably. Yeah, yeah, for, that's that's a good point. You know, I I tend to focus more on small practitioners and small firms. I share business and marketing advice, and you know, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share stuff that would be of interest to them. Right. No, that's good. Okay, so we have one more question. We have time for one more question. So I'm gonna start with you, Mark. If you could give one piece of advice to a manufacturer about using social media, what would it be? And you can maybe give more than one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of rambles here, but, but number no, one, is I think Stephen and Annika both said, and that is just do it. Just get started. Get involved. Don't worry about if you're doing it right or wrong. Get in there. You can't do it wrong. You will start to learn what's working and what's not. Uh, so try things. See what works. Um, focus on building relationships. Watch others to see what you can learn from them. Budget for it and give the person in charge of it the freedom to do it with minimal approval process. So that's my advice. That's good. All right, Enoch, did you have some other closing thoughts? Yeah, I just want to add to that and say look at what other people are doing and, and emulate it. You know, you don't need to copy it exactly, but go out there and look at what other successful people are doing. We've given the example of Lowe's already. They have a robust social media platform. You know, take, take lessons from that and go out there and try to recreate that. But once again, get on there, do it. In terms of the different social media channels, focus on one, and then after you master that or you feel like you've, you've attained a certain stature in that, start to focus on another one. But even though you're on one, you can still syndicate your post to other networks. That's the framework that I, that's one option. Okay. And Stephen, I don't want to leave you out. Did you have any thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it would just be to um, to, to really hone in on a voice uh, and make sure that you stick with it and be persistent. No, that's good. Okay. Well, those are all the questions we have, and we're kind of out of time. So I just want to let everybody in the audience know that if we, you know, we haven't gotten to your questions, and we will definitely um, kind of filter through the questions and you know if you have them specifically for Mark or Stephen or Enoch we will get those to them and I also want to say thank you so much for um, to Mark and Enoch and Stephen you guys have been really really good and um, I really appreciate your time and I'm sure we've all learned a lot so thank you for doing that thanks for having yeah, us absolutely I mean it's great I yes. look forward to um, to the building product manufacturers getting out there and embracing some of this because they have a voice and, and we want to hear it um, speaking from the architectural side. We want, we want to engage with you. Right. And if anybody wants a transcript of today's webinar, it will be available on our website, so um, functionatl.com. 
All right, everybody, thank you and have a great